There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ellen Hawley back to my channel. Ellen Hawley is a novelist, an American novelist, has been living in Cornwall for some years. Uh, welcome back, Ellen. Hi, glad to be here. We are here to talk about um, mostly lesbian literature, but also a little bit of gay male literature for good measure. And this video is going to go up early during Pride Month in June. Ellen is the author, among other books that I haven't read this novel from 2022, Other People Manage. That was one of my top reads of 2022. I have a, a great discussion with Ellen about this novel. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And this is a, about many other topics, but particularly about a lesbian couple. And it's now out in paperback. It's now out in paperback. Great. And I think it's available worldwide or wherever you can get, you know, the major booksellers, I think you can get it around the world but hasn't been published in north america yet which is a crying shame we're also going to talk at the end of the chat about ellen's forthcoming novel which will probably be published right around the time this video goes up so stay tuned for that but i've invited ellen back uh any excuse will do but i've invited her back to talk about lesbian literature that has meant something to her and, or any other kind of queer literature so ellen what's your first how should we get this started well, let's start with the pre-Stonewall literature. At a time when everybody had to be in the closet, any, anyone who was gay or lesbian, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of literature out there that you could find. The first one that I know of is The Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall, which is a dismal book where everybody is miserable and dies. It just makes you want to slit your wrists. But it was out there and it was lesbian. And when there was nothing else, people clung to it. That was followed in the 1950s in the US, at least. I'm not sure about elsewhere, by a group of books by a woman named Ann Bannon. Um, and they really were pulp. They were pretty cheesy, in my opinion, but they were a lifeline for a lot of people. And I was recently reading an essay by uh, Joan Nestle who wrote about them in 1983. I tried to find a link online to the essay and I can't find it. She posted it on Facebook. It's too ephemeral, we'll never find it again. But what, she's, what she talked about, what it meant to her when she was just coming out, and again, there was, there was no representation of lesbians out there for her. In response, somebody wrote that she used to buy them at the drugstore and she always bought something else, what anything else to put on top of it when she brought it up to the cash register because it felt so dangerous to buy this stuff. And my partner who came out before Stonewall said for her, it, it, she, it, she never bought them. They somehow found their way into her life because they were circulating in her college dormitory and we'll never know who it was who went out and bought them, but somehow they found her, their way to her. And she said it felt dangerous even to read them because somebody might walk into her dorm room and find her. That was the, the, the feeling of that era, and that was the importance of, of those books. When you move on just a little bit to 1952, you get The Price of Salt, which was written by Patricia Highsmith, who wrote the Ripley books, under a pseudonym, mind you, because she was nobody's fool. She had a career to make. Uh, she wrote a book called The Price of Salt. It's less pulpy. I don't love it, but it was it was an important milestone. When you get into the 60s, you get a, a novel called Patience and Sarah. Have you ever seen that one? Um, I have seen it. I think it's been recently brought back into print by a, a small press in, in British Columbia. Wow. Bless them for doing it. Yeah, um, is it, something it was Miller? Something Miller? It was Isabel Miller, and that too was a pseudonym. Her real name is something I didn't write down. So <laughs> we'll That's all right. Isabel Miller. Um, it, I ran into it shortly after I came out, and it is the only book that I actually remember hugging. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> it, um, it's, uh, it's set in the 19th century, so it's historical fiction about a very touching relationship between two women who have no model for the life they're building for themselves. It's well written. It's completely absorbing, or it was to me. And it, it really marked a turning point. And she, for years, 
carried that book in shop, copies of her book in a shopping bag to meetings of the gay liberation groups of one sort or another and sold them one by one by one until finally in the probably 70s, it was re republished and swept the lesbian community. I think, I don't know how recently, within the last 10 years, maybe it was brought back into print by Arsenal Pulp Press in Vancouver. Mm, that's great. With Stonewall and gay liberation, in the lesbian community, feminism and gay liberation cross-pollinated. And at that point, it becomes almost impossible to separate one from the other. I remember poetry particularly as really being a form that carried the news to us. Huh? And I want to introduce anyone who doesn't know them to the poetry of Olga Brumas, who won, excuse me, my chair is spinning sideways if I look a little strange here. Um, and I'm very carefully pulling out the wrong book. Hang on, here we go. This is the book beginning with O. And th this, was a, this was the early 70s, and it was a time when a, a lesbian poet could fill an auditorium. I remember going to a reading by Ad Adrienne Rich, and it was packed. It's <laughs> this is poetry, you know, it's the form that these days we think no one reads. Let me read you a, a, a poem. By, it's called Lita and the Swan. You have red toenails, chestnut hair on your calves. Oh, let me love you. The fathers are lingering in the background, nodding assent. I dream of you shedding calico, slow motion from your breasts. I dream of you leaving with skinny women. I dream you know. The fathers are nodding like overdosed lechers. The fathers approve with authority. Persian emperors ordering the sun shall rise every dawn, set each dusk. I dream. White bathroom surfaces, rounded basins, you stand among loosening hair, arms, my senses. The fathers are Dresden figurines, vestigial, anecdotal, small, sculptures shaped by the hands of nuns. Yours, crimson-tipped, take no part in that crude abnegation. Scarlet liturgies shake our room. Amaryllis blooms in your upper thighs. Water lily on mine. Fervent delta, the bed afloat. Sheer linen billowing on the wind. Nile, Amazon, Mississippi. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. She, um, she's the real yeah. thing. She won a Yale Younger Poets Award, and that really catapulted her into visibility. So, right. yeah, she's wonderful. If I can, I'd like to read you a poem by a, a, a gay man, Jim White, of the James, the James White Review. Yes. Not yes. because it has a lot of connection, but because I can't resist doing it. He was a lovely human being. I knew him when I lived in Minneapolis. Oh, wow. This is called The First Time. Sometimes I'm there first. Sweet, sweet men. I light candles, burn the best incense, make them think it's some kind of temple, and it rather is. Like this guy who hauled parts for a living, whatever the hell that means. He was like caught light through glass, and so the candles and the incense. What would you do with a new cult? He touched my body the way shadows fall from an old subject he'd buried, and he looked at me without fear. Sweet guy. So sweet I became really shy and hot, so I had to move easy. Wouldn't you? What do you do when it's someone's first time? I try to clean up my act, make it into a first-rate number so he knows he's been with someone. We're bunglers when it's really good. Bow legs, pimply backs, scrawny chest hair, full of mistakes and good intentions. And it doesn't have to do with women. They're fine, too. Just some understanding between two men. We're bunglers when it's really good. Was that the line? That is so oh, That's going to yeah. stick with me. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. I, did, I didn't know what, what James White wrote. Uh, or maybe I did it one time and forgot. But I need to check out more James White poetry. Did he only write poetry? He only wrote poetry... I had some of his other books. I think this is the one to get. Salt Ecstasies okay. has several that are just 
stunning. It's fantastic. You knew him. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? He had been a, um, a ballet dancer. And um, by the time I knew him, he had had to quit. I, th I think because of his heart, he died of a heart attack. And relatively young, I think he was in his 50s. He was a very gentle, lovely man. That's really about all I can tell you. Um, and um, Sure comes through in that poem. Yeah, greatly missed, I think, by a lot of people. He had a real impact on a lot of writers. I think I'm going to go out of sequence a little bit here and talk a little bit about lesbian fiction as opposed to fiction that involves lesbians. Oh, please, um, yes. Because I think one of the things that happened is that lesbian fiction became associated with writing particularly about sex and writing, you know, intensely about relationships. My partner published a, um, a mystery with a lesbian press. It's very good. And the editor kept saying, can you put more hot sex in it? And my partner was saying, no, this woman's running for her life. This, you know, she's got something else on her mind right now. <laughs> now, are you uh, comfortable to tell us the title and author of that book? Or if you don't the, want the, to, I'll edit. The, the, the author is Ida Swearingen, which is almost impossible. It's, it's swearing with an E-N on the end. Um, I know. There's, and, a, there's a famous young booktuber, with, and that's her name, Shelley Swearingen. No kidding. Well, yes. there aren't that many swear engines out there. They're probably related. I will um, follow. And they probably don't know each other. The book is called Owl of the Desert. Okay. And it's One good. Day. I, you know, I, I admit to a bias, but it is good. Yes. And what she was writing was, was a mystery. And rather than, you know, a book about lesbian sex. Yes, you know, the protagonist is a lesbian. Yes, she has a relationship of sorts, but that's not, that's not what drives the book. The lesbianism isn't incidental, but it isn't the end all and be all of, of, of the novel. I think a lot of what people think of when you say lesbian fiction is fiction where the relationship and the sex are the point. And you get, basically it's become a genre. It's become genre writing like zombies and, you know, and so forth. And I have no argument with that. I, you know, I, I have respect for genre writing. It doesn't happen, you know, le lesbian fiction doesn't happen to be what draws me. What I want to write is fiction about the world that often has lesbians in it, but I don't want to write only that. Something that became clear to me when I was once a member of a lesbian writers group and realized that one or two of the members were, were saw the world only through the lens of lesbianism. And I don't, and I don't want to. I mean, you know, I don't, I can't edit that out, but I can't fit everything within that little, those confines. I'm more drawn to books like Emma Donahue's Pull of the Stars. Have you read that one? I have not. It's a beautiful book. She's a good, good writer. Uh, it's set during the uh, flu epidemic in Ireland. And an attraction between two women is a very small part of the book. It comes in only at the end, very delicately. And it, it, that isn't the focus of the book. And yet it's there and it matters. And without it, it would be a different book. Or you get Naomi Alderman's Disobedience, which is about a very orthodox Jewish community in London. And one of the daughters of the community has left and comes back to a woman she is in love with, who's married to a man and stayed in the community. And it's about what happens between those two women and the choice to leave the community or stay in the community because they cannot have that relationship and stay in the community. And at least as much as it's about lesbianism and, and the attraction between the two women, it's about belonging. It's about the warmth that you get in a community and the limits that a community puts on you. 
and the, the constriction. I don't know that book. That sounds really great. It is. It's, and she, too, is a, is a fine writer. If anyone is interested in looking at the range of some lesbian fiction, Terry Wolverton has three, three anthologies, which are out of date by now, but they're still interesting, uh, called Hers, Brilliant New, Brilliant New Fiction by Lesbian Writers. There are at least three of them. There may be more. It's a good cross-section, if, if dated. I'd like to ask you by, about at least one writer. I'm uh, dying to know if you have read, and I'd be shocked if you hadn't read anything by Jane Rule. Ah, not in a hundred years. And I no, don't yeah, really remember enough to say anything even vaguely intelligent. My favorite by her is Memory Board, which was about an elderly lesbian couple that one of whom was in the throat, was su dealing, suffering from... Uh, struggling with, challenged by Alzheimer's. And that was a powerful mm. novel. At least I thought so when I was in my 20s. And then there's another Canadian novelist who who is a lesbian. And her fiction is kind of like what you were describing. It's they it often has lesbian characters, but that isn't the point of the novel. And that is Anne-Marie MacDonald. Fall on Your Knees was her debut novel. And it was about many, many things. And it was about a Lebanese-American family. And, and there certainly was a lesbian relationship in it. And I put off reading that novel for so long because it was such a big, chunky book. And I read it in about three days. I couldn't put it down. You read a novel about, I have it on the shelf. I bought it because you tweeted about it. The World and All It Holds. Ah, what did you think of it? I haven't read it. I bought it because you were so excited ah. about it. So uh, could you want to tell us more about this one? This one just came out this year, Alexander Heyman. Alex, actually, and there's another book, actually, that I should, I should mention when we get to the end of that. Um, Alexander Heyman, The World and All That It Holds, is really is a novel about, <laughs> it's all that it holds. It, it's about a, a gay couple, and the relationship is, is really quite beautiful and continues long after one of them dies. And the, you know, the, the, the part, the partner, the lover is present in, throughout. It goes from Eastern Europe through across Russia, across China. I mean, it takes in an immense amount of history, World War I, the Russian Revolution, and so it takes in an immense amount of geography and history, but also of, um, of changes in the protagonist's life. It's quite a piece of work. I just have heard nothing but like the highest praise from anybody that's read it. So I must get to it. And you said there was one other book you wanted to make sure to talk about? Yeah, I almost lost track of this one. It's, it's uh, Becky Chambers, The Long Way to a Small Planet, Small Angry Planet. And I'm holding it up and I don't think you can see it. There it is. It's science fiction. It's again, well-written. It has an, it has a surprising number of forbidden relationships in it. And since it's science fiction, you're getting into interspecies relationships and everything else, which is an interesting way to, to change your perspective on forbidden relationships and Absolutely. you know both the, the the joys and the difficulties it's worth reading another highly praised um, book and uh, she's written quite a few since then that are all kind of linked are they not isn't that kind of like a series i'll have to look for them i didn't know that okay. I, I may be wrong it just maybe by the same author and not connected but people are just go crazy every time she has a new book out they're so excited so <laughs> speaking of Novels that are incidentally have lesbian or queer themes, but are about many other things. Ellen, tell us about your novel that's coming out in the middle of June. Okay, it's called A Decent World. It's being published in the UK, but will be available online if if it if it doesn't pick up a North American publisher. It's one that is very close to my heart. It does have a lesbian relationship in it, although it's. Again, it, it, it's not the point of the novel. The novel really is about a young woman's grandmother who raised her, who, is, who, who has just died when the novel opens. 
the grandmother was communist. And this is the narrator, the, the central characters grappling with the political legacy that the grandmother has left her. Can an ordin- a group of ordinary people really change the world? And the legacy of the of the Communist Party and of the Russian Revolution is, <laughs> to put it mildly, not a pure one. Where did it all go wrong? Did it have to go wrong? Has capitalism gone at least just as wrong, maybe more so? You know, what, what can ordinary people do to try to build a decent world? And is it possible? I'm a child of the uh, American Red Scare. I grew up in the 1950s. And frankly, the novel terrifies me. <laughs> Because, you know, it's this is everything we didn't talk about when I was a kid, publicly. That is one of the most interesting descriptions of a novel by its author that I've ever heard, that the novel terrifies you. you. Can you say a little bit more about that? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, you know, writing sympathetically about communists is, um, you know, it, it, interestingly enough, in Britain, nobody seems to understand what I'm... <laughs> what my problem is, but in the US, I mean, it's scary enough for somebody to say they're a socialist, to say they're a communist, oh my God, the world is ending. I don't know to what extent that's still true. I've been in the UK for 17 years now, but that's that's the world I came out of. Well, I think I'm going to stop there because I'm going to have Ellen come back after I have got my hot little hands on the novel and read it, and we're gonna chat at length about latest offering and you probably finished writing that novel quite a while back so uh, what are you working on now if it's not a big secret well two things actually i've got a novel that i've started uh it's about it's set in the 70s it's about feminism and violence actually uh because in, in the 70s parts of the left were very drawn to violence and you know you get the weatherman and groups like that and you get an assortment of bombings. Exactly why I'm writing that, I don't know, because it seems like an odd thing to be writing as the right wing in in the US degenerates into violence, but it seems to be the story that's calling me. In addition, I've got something that's probably unpublishable, but but I love it. It's a lot of fun to write, which is a book on English history called Stomping Through English History, a drop-in guide. It's a lot of fun. It's a very wiseacre take on English history. And I've, I started out blogging, which uh, initially seemed like a good way to publicize books. It actually probably isn't, but it is really time consuming. But I ended up blogging a lot about English history. And I Absolutely. am a bit of a wise yeah. ass. And, um, yes. and I've had a lot of fun with it. And may I put your, your Twitter ID in the show notes as well? Put the People Twitter ID in and put the, put the blog uh, URL in if oh, you would. Both. Yeah, absolutely. It's probably unpublishable because it is episodic. And the publishing world doesn't like episodic just now. So I, it, it, I suspect it's going to go nowhere, but it's a lot of fun. Ellen, thanks for giving us your time and your, your wisdom and your recommendations. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you again very soon. Wonderful. Thanks for inviting me, Sean. It's a pleasure.